Okay, that sounds great. Bear with me while I figure out the technology here. Okay. Can everyone see the presentation slides? Yes, okay. Unfortunately, you guys won't be able to see me and the presentation uh, slides. With everything that's been going on here, we are limited in terms of the space that I'm able to use to record, so I'm using um, my personal laptop. But um, if you have any questions or anything, um, feel free to just send them in as the discussion goes on or raise a hand or anything, or um, just let me know. So as I said before, my name is Rachel. I'm one of the pharmacists that works here. I've been here for about a year and a half. I do both inpatient and outpatient um, treatment of heart failure. And so what I'm gonna talk about is what to prescribe and when. And primarily I'm going to focus on the treatment of heart failure and chronic heart failure because that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and hopefully you will find it helpful. Just a few objectives here. I'm just gonna review chronic heart failure therapies, the data behind them, why we utilize them, discuss some tips for optimization. Um, sorry about that, let me turn that off. Um, discuss tips for optimization of our guideline-directed therapies, and then discuss some strat uh, strategies to facilitate adherence, because that is one of the biggest issues that I see in the outpatient setting. Not only here, but everywhere else I have worked is just the pill burden that these patients have, and really how do we navigate that, and how do we best um, help our patients navigate that. So um, in 2017, the American College of Cardiology actually created an expert consensus decision pathway or document highlighting the main concerns with advanced heart failure and kind of the top 10 things they wanted to hone in on um, and really focus on. And as you can see, the first two of those are really how to implement guideline-directed therapy, which is what I'm gonna be discussing today. Um, and then the third one um, that I'll be discussing today is, ad is adherence. For anyone interested in any of the other topics that are on here, I will not be addressing those, but the link is, or the um, citation is down at the bottom. So feel free to, if any of these other topics appeal to you, um, check in that information out. So these are things that not only the American Car Car College of Cardiology feels is important for our patients, um, but I see on a day-to-day -day basis as being a high priority for them. So what is our, what are we doing here? Um, Evidence-based guideline-driven care is what we push through the guidelines through our day-to-day -day practice up here. Um, it's been shown in numerous studies and in anecdotal patient experience to help improve patient outcomes, reduce, reduce healthcare expenditures, um, hopefully reduce hospitalizations, improve morbidity, mortality, and you know, patient's quality of life. Um, also, it increases hospital and physician reimbursement. This is a big thing when we get to discussing guideline-directed therapy and really hitting most of our targets for um, some of those specific medications shown to have chronic benefit in heart failure patients. So I briefly touched on a little bit of these. What are our goals of care for the heart failure patients? Ultimately to reduce signs and symptoms of congestion, improve their everyday life, um, reduce vasoconstriction to then decrease the risk of cardiac remodeling in the heart and the activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Um, and ultimately this leads to lessening or slowing of remodeling and sometimes actually can, re, uh, can lead to reversal um, of some of those uh, remodeling changes within the heart. All of this, the end goal is going to be improved end organ perfusion, prolonging life, and hopefully um, slowing disease progression. So a nice balance there. Before we get into the nitty gritty and the medication classes individually, I wanted to kind of take a look from a broad picture of really what's been happening in heart failure treatment from a medication standpoint. Um, so as you can see here, really the prime time for drug discovery and medication clinical trials was happening probably in the 1990s to the early 2000s. Um, we have had some advancements in the last five years uh, that have come on the market. Um, some new literature that seems that is very promising and some that is in the pipeline. Um, but the real big, I guess, bang for your buck was probably in the early um, 90s and 2000s. As you can see, so um, just to briefly review, I won't go into all of these uh, trials independently, um, but the first ones you're going to see on the market, so these ones all the way down here are going to be looking at your ACE inhibitors. Consensus and Solved, we're primarily looking at your ACE inhibitors. Beta blockers were next on the market or on the docket for review for heart failure patients. 
Um, this initially was quite contradictory, um, and, and patients were, or providers were very skeptical about beta blockers with the negative inotropic effect. That's why they took a little bit longer um, for us to really get into the um, mindset of utilizing it in these patients. Um, then as you can see here, um, we do have the data for boronolactone and the aldosterone antagonists coming in the end of um, the 1990s. And then a lot of our hydralazine um, and isosorbide data, specifically in African-American patients, is gonna come in the early 2000s. As we continue on, really there's not a whole lot for about 10 years or so, maybe a little bit less, um, but the shift trial with Ivabradine down here at the bottom, Emphasis is looking at a plerinone, which again kind of piggies back on what we already knew about aldosterone. The dose trial, which we know did not ultimately show a difference um, in outcomes per se, but we do know we often utilize diuretics in these patients. And then the Paradigm HF trial is probably the most, um, one of the newer trials, and there have been some subsequent ones we'll discuss that have come out since that time as well. So jumping right into evidence for ACE, inhibitor, ACE inhibitors or ARBs, um, they should be utilized in all patients regardless of their New York Heart Association functional class. Uh, initially, they were studied in probably the class two through three um, patients, but that has been expanded since to even patients who do not show symptoms. It actually shows to prevent symptomatology and worsening of um, cardiovascular function in those patients who are even at risk for developing heart failure symptoms. Um, so all New York Heart Association classes should ideally be on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Um, generally, there is, a, there is some more robust data for use of ACE inhibitors over ARBs um, as first line. I would still, if you're planning to keep patients on an ACE or an ARB independently, I do like the idea of utilizing ACE inhibitors. They're often once a day versus um, a lot of our ARBs we're using twice a day. Um, and again, there is a little bit more robust data. However, if you're considering transitioning to a newer agent, those are the patients that sometimes I will prefer an ARB over um, an ACE because it makes that transition a little bit faster, which we'll discuss um, later on down the road. Um, they should not be used in combination. We did look at those um, and found that there were increased uh, risk of worsening renal function, acute renal failure, and very high rates of symptomatic hypotension. Generally speaking, um, I do try to avoid initiation in patients who are hypovolemic. So if you're seeing somebody in clinic who, it's pretty uncommon, but if you see someone who does look dry or they are in the hospital and you're initiating a therapy and again, somebody may be dry after they were over diuresed, that is going to increase your risk of failing therapy from both a hypotension standpoint as well as a um, serum creatinine increase standpoint. So I gen to generally tend to reserve these for patients who are either euvolemic or if they're hypervolemic, they tend to be, uh, they tend to tolerate them fairly well. Again, at the bottom here, it shows the numbers. This is from the initial data um, in um, our previous clinical trials. As far as monitoring for ACE and ARB therapy, about 10 to 20% of patients are going to develop that ACE-induced cough, which can be quite troublesome for patients. Generally, our practice would be here to transition them to an ARB or again, um, some of the newer agents if they would meet criteria for that. Renal dysfunction and hyperkalemia is roughly equivalent between the two. I've not seen a preference between um, ACE inhibitors or ARB therapy in terms of causing that less often. Always remember the contraindications um, as listed on the slide. Angioedema does have a higher, like is very uncommon. Um, does have a higher likelihood of incidence in African Americans. Um, and it, again, as I stated, it is rare. If patients do have angioedema to ACE inhibitors, an ARB rechallenge can be considered with very close monitoring, and I have had success with that in the past. Um, but informing the patient of what those signs and symptoms to be looking out for, chances are they already know because they experienced it once before. Um, but just making sure you educate them very well, or if they're admitted to the hospital, that is actually a prime time to be able to monitor um, for a transition from that standpoint. As far as um, chronic monitoring, again, if you're in starting this as a new therapy in the hospital or starting it as a new therapy in the outpatient setting, generally within one to two weeks, 
is where we would check uh, and reevaluate a BMP for potassium and serum creatinine. I expect a 30% increase or less in that serum creatinine and all of that should be relatively, um, it should be expected and therefore should be relatively benign. Um, if you do have borderline patients, the suggestion would be to, again, repeat probably a week after that if there are concerns. Um, that's kind of our general practice here and usually what we would do. So as I mentioned earlier, um, ACE and ARB therapy was the first really to be studied on the market for heart failure patients. The ARNI therapy, so this is Secubitril Valsartan, is the only one of these on the market at this time. Um, it is Valsartan in addition to a neprilysin inhibitor, um, which decreases the um, kind of metabolism of BNP or the breakdown of BNP, leaving that around longer um, to allow natural uh, naturesis, vasodilation, all of the good benefits that BNP provides us when patients are volume overloaded and have that left ventricular or biventricular stretch. Um, so this is a relatively new agent. It is recommended by the um, uh, AHA guidelines for further reduction in morbidity and mortality. The primary trial did study this in comparison to enalapril um, as a head-to-head -head trial, whereas most of the other trials mentioned were comparing their data to a placebo. So it does have uh, strong evidence to further reduce. Again, these numbers in reduction of mortality and hospitalization are lower than the previous slide if you're um, following along very closely. However, in comparison, those were compared to a placebo. Here they're being compared to the equivalent um, therapy we just mentioned on the slide. We do oftentimes in our clinic utilize this kind of upfront and right off the bat. We don't always wait to see if a patient tolerates an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, especially patients who come in with a systolic blood pressure of greater than 100. Um, if we see those patients, we're almost like, you know, drooling. We're like, yes, you know, let us have a chance. <laughs> um, and so these therapies, we do use, utilize them very often upfront. I will go through some data that supports safety for that as well. Um, but I do know there are a lot of questions surrounding these therapies, or there were at least at the beginning um, when they first made it into the uh, 2016 guideline update, because there was just not a whole lot of data um, for them. But now I think as the time has gone on, we've learned that their safety profile is very similar to the previously mentioned medication. It is very important that you guys always remember there's a 36 hour washout that is required for uh, anyone transitioning from an ACE inhibitor over to this therapy. Um, and that is due to an increased risk of hypotension and an increased risk of angioedema. Um, so this is not required for someone transitioning from an ARB. It is solely for someone transitioning from an ACE inhibitor over. As I mentioned on the slide, where the timeline was added, Paradigm HF was the big trial that showed benefit for this therapy um, in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. There have been two other relatively large trials um, that have shown kind of the questions that arose were how are our patients going to be able to tolerate these therapies because of the added hypotension associated with them? And are they safe to start in a patient who is newly diagnosed in the hospital? These are all questions we still did not know the answers to. Um, so the transition trial was one that looked at um, initiation, pre-discharge and after discharge. And actually a, a large number of patients were able to achieve their target dose as an outpatient. There are many studies and sub-studies looking at this information that state a gradual titration is usually going to be the most successful in helping patients obtain higher doses of these therapy. And I truly believe that that is across the board for any and all of these therapies, maybe not just the um, ARNIs in particular, but ACE inhibitors and ARBs. The longer you space out those titrations and allow them to kind of reequilibrate, get used to what their baseline is, um, the higher likelihood you will have of them being able to achieve higher doses. Now, that does make it more difficult because on the practitioner's side, you have to remember to you know, keep contacting these people and up titrating these medications. And the longer you go without seeing them, um, can make that a little bit more difficult. But it has been shown to, to have some benefit in terms of the patient's tolerability. And then Pioneer HF, um, this one just came out at the end of last year, I believe. 
um, and showed that starting it in the hospital um, has also been shown to be safe. And um, they did have similar rates of hypotension in comparison to those who were uh, on enalapril therapy. So similar uh, in terms of a design of the Paradigm HF, but again, all its patients admitted to the hospital with acute decompensation. Um, so just a resource for anyone that doesn't utilize this therapy very often and just wants to make sure that they're doing it safely and appropriately. There are a lot of recommendations um, as to how to transition. Again, it, do, it is a more potent agent, does have higher uh, effects uh, on blood or more effects on blood pressure, higher incidences of hypotension. So starting on the more cautious side is really what we've done here with creating our algorithm especially in the outpatient setting if you are practicing in that setting. As far as beta blocker therapy, uh, again, this is gonna be a recommendation across the board for all patients, regardless of their New York Heart Association functional class. Um, it is the, the three beta blockers that are indicated for heart failure are listed there on the slide. We try very hard to prioritize these medications and to, to use beta blockers that are indicated for our heart failure patients. Again, there may be a time when a patient's admitted to the hospital and they're tenuous and you transition them for a period of time over to a tartrate formulation of metoprolol. And for the three or four, two or three days that you're stabilizing them, that may be reasonable. But as far as the long-term therapy goes, um, again, in order to ensure you're hitting your targets, then uh, transition over to succinate prior to discharge if possible. Uh, when do we initiate therapy in these patients? Beta blockers are a little trickier. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this presentation, providers for a long period of time were actually very concerned about using beta blockers due to their negative inotropic effect and their transient decline in cardiac output. Uh, usually it's very well tolerated in most patients if you're identifying the right patients. Um, so those appropriate patients, in my opinion, are those who are compensated or who are not showing any signs or symptoms of low cardiac output state. Um, so they are well perfused, warm, um, really no other signs of end organ perfusion or concerns with end organ perfusion. And those who are euvolemic or near euvolemic. Um, the reason I say that, they would probably tolerate it if they were hypervolemic. Um, but if you're trying to diurese them and you're trying to get more blood flow to the kidneys to ultimately result in long-term diuresis, that negative inotropic effect is counteracting that. Um, it likely wouldn't throw them over the edge into shock as it would be if it were someone you were starting a uncompensated patient. Um, but just as a kind of contradicting therapy, uh, that is the reason that I just recommend or we recommend euvolemic um, or near euvolemia. In patients who are admitted to the hospital, um, generally speaking, unless they are showing signs of end organ perfusion and concern for um, cardiogenic shock, it's recommended to continue these agents. Uh, decreasing the uh, medication, cutting it in half, is often a strategy that we employ for our patients just to ensure it still stays on their medication profile so we know that they're still on it. We try to discharge them when we're able to. Um, there is some strong data to support that if patients are discharged from the hospital on beta blockers, they're more likely to be convinced data, they're more likely to uh, be on beta blockers long term. Um, so that is a strategy that you can utilize um, and patients admitted who are maybe your, your subset two who are just warm and wet that requires some um, volume removal but no concern for low cardiac output. But contrary to that, um, these agents should be held in anyone that you're concerned for low output heart failure. Um, so anyone who is hypotensive, has increased LFTs, increased serum creatinine, is cold to touch, you know, all of your basic signs of low output um, would be someone to immediately stop this therapy. And again, all of the beta blocker trials, uh, I did not mention this before, but I will with this therapy in particular, is all the beta blocker trials have shown a dose-dependent relationship. So the higher the dose, the better the outcomes for patients long-term. Same thing has been shown for ACE inhibitors and ARBs, but the strongest correlative data is with these beta blockers. So keep that in mind. 
monitoring again just start low and go slow but try to get idea or optimal doses if possible um, this stuff's all pretty 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 basic which therapy do you start first if you have a patient in clinic who is a new diagnosis heart failure just you know sitting in front of you um, it's going to be there the CBIS 3 data really showed there's no difference and either one of them is safe um, so he, these are a couple of things that we take into consideration in our clinic as to which one to start first, or sometimes patients will tolerate both therapies if you catch them early on with New York Heart Association class two, um, good blood pressure, sometimes they'll tolerate both at the same time. Um, but a lot of these I've mentioned as we were going through the slides in terms of evaluating their volume status and which one to prefer in which patient. Um, again, this blood pressure of a, greater than 100 is a moving target. Um, you know, we do continue therapy for patients who have blood pressures lower than that number, but I figured this was a safe bet to um, discuss for at least starting an, uh, starting therapy. And then, uh, you know, evaluating their serum creatinine, renal function for ACEs and ARBs, and then evaluating kind of their past medical history for beta blockers, where you may initiate therapy sooner rather than, um, you know, if you're on the border and you're trying to pick between the two, Patients who have persistent arrhythmias or recent MI, you may favor one therapy over the other, which that being beta blockers. Uh, lastly, for our guideline directed therapy, aldosterone antagonist, um, monitoring for these remains very similar. Really, they're utilized most often in patients who are on the two therapies we mentioned before um, with class three or class four symptoms. Uh, a player known is a great option for patients who experience gynecomastia, which is the most common side effect that I see aside from um, elevated potassium or elevated serum creatinine. Clarinol is a little bit more expensive, so we don't just go ahead and give it to all of our patients for that reason. Um, caution should be used in patients who have an EGFR less than 30 and a potassium of greater than 4.8. I am much more lenient on those restrictions now that we have agents like Belta, uh, well, sorry, excuse me, we have agents like the potassium, uh, potassium binders to help remove some of the extra um, potassium in, in the blood um, and therefore allow us for optimization of these therapies. Um, so now that we have those, there is a little bit more of a wiggle room in, in terms of what the exact hard cutoffs are for these agents. This is just a review that kind of shows a lot of the numbers on why we got to use or why we've decided to use these guideline directed therapies. There is also data that um, in our heart failure patients, even if their ejection fraction improves, continuing therapy allows them to have better outcomes long term. That data was the TREAD HF trial that came out about a year and a half ago, I believe, um, which showed re even removing therapy four weeks later, you did start to see a reduction in ejection fraction and some increase in symptoms. In these now I'm going to briefly go through just some of the non-guideline directed therapy, but some options we have. So diuretics are really going to be your mainstay of therapy for symptoms. These are the ones that actually patients really truly feel an effect from, um, most of that being that they don't enjoy the frequency with which they have to use the restroom. However, um, we do know that means it's working. So that's something good for us. Uh, as far as utilizing outpatient strategies and outpatient therapies, we do a lot of torsamide here, especially in our Patients who um, struggle with volume status, have ascites, have hold on to extra fluid easily, just for that difference in bioavailability. Which you can see here on the next slide, just talks about um, really all the pharmacokinetics and why some of these agents may work a little bit better or some patients may have better response to some over others. I won't go through all of this information, but um, the big differences here really are bioavailability, duration of action, um, and that's really about it. Metolazone is added on there um, as a preferred um, agent for those who have diuretic resistance despite very high doses of loop diuretics. Um, it is our go-to usually dosed once every day, once every other day. It does have a half-life of over 24 hours, so you can start these patients on this slower end saying maybe just take this two days a week, um, and they'll probably still see a boost in that diuretic effect for two to three days afterwards. Um, other miscellaneous therapies, these are both shown to now reduce um, hospitalizations for our heart failure patients. 
So Joxin is going to be more for your advanced patients versus Ivabradine, which is your group two and or class two and uh, class three. Ivabradine does have a few other criteria in terms of um, they have to be in normal sinus rhythm, they have to still have certain heart rate criteria, and they have to also be on maximum beta blocker therapy and or intolerant to beta blockers. Um, inherently, I would say I don't utilize these all that often unless, um, unless we really have someone who's very symptomatic from an elevated heart rate or if they still have AFib despite all of the other agents that we've exhausted. Um, for digoxin in particular, obviously we can't use ivabradine in atrial fibrillation patients. Um, but I generally haven't adopted these all that often in practice. It's just a couple of patients here and there that are persistently symptomatic, persistently being hospitalized. What's something that I can grab for um, to utilize in my toolbox? As far as hydralazine and isosorbide, again, this is primarily um, at least the mortality, morbidity mortality benefit has been shown in African Americans who are still symptomatic despite all of your previous guideline directed therapy. Um, as far as optimizing GDMT, these are just a few recommendations that I have in terms of how to monitor, how often to titrate, you know, start slow or start low and go slow, type, uh, transition if you can for some of your patients, just a couple of big pillars or things to think about. Um, there was recently some data that came out of the CHAMP registry that looks at the percent of patients that really are getting optimal guideline directed therapy in the outpatient setting. Um, and as you can see here, we're doing a better job. Uh, about 73% are on uh, a RAS inhibitor, 67% on a beta blocker. The MRAs, we're not doing as, as hot on there, um, but we're doing okay. Um, anything we can do to improve these numbers overall will hopefully be of benefit to our patients. Um, about 22%, I think, of these patients were receiving all three therapies. Oh, yep, 22% were receiving a dose of all three guideline-directed therapies. So there's still room for us to work and to improve. Um, and 13% were receiving um, some of our newer therapies. This is just for you guys to have. I'm not gonna go through this today. <laughs> and only 1.1% of patients were actually re reaching target goals. Um, for these therapies, which is difficult. There are a lot of reasons that we and a lot of confounders that we aren't able to reach target therapies for, as mentioned on this slide. So you'll see um, older age, hypotension, renal insufficiency. I can't give you the exact cookie cutter reason or way to navigate this for every individual patient. Um, these are the most common reasons for some of the patients not to obtain guideline directed therapy. And I know it's unrealistic to obtain guideline directed therapy in all these patients. Um, but hopefully some of the tools um, here that I'm about to share with you can help to navigate through some of those um, and at least attempt optimization. If it's not going to happen, then it is what it is. We're all realists, right? <laughs> um, so far as blood pressure, everyone always says, what is, what is too low? Patients always ask, what is too low? Um, it's really important to make sure you have patients monitoring as an outpatient and at home because blood pressures can vary widely in the clinic versus at home. Um, we generally will utilize a systolic blood pressure of 90 uh, or less as kind of that's where we're going to stop trying to push therapy in those patients or we will stop sooner than that if they develop symptoms such as lightheadedness or di dizziness uh, that impact their daily life. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a lot of data for a lot of these agents that slowly increasing them and allowing patients to equilibrate and get used to their kind of new baseline will allow them to reach some of these higher goals. So one to two weeks, that sounds very aggressive. It is very aggressive and it's something that is in an ideal world, something we would do. But if that's spaced out to every four weeks, every eight weeks, at least we're trying. That's all we can do. Um, and then again, how low is too low? Very uncommon, but always think about volume status and make sure that patients aren't getting too dry if they're showing you signs of, um, you know, if, they're, if they truly look dry, if they have elevated creatinine out of, out of the blue, maybe they've had a recent, you know, GI bug or something that's caused them to not be taking, you know, have them on diuretics. Always something to keep in mind whenever you're evaluating your patients.
here are some ways to kind of help optimize as well. Spacing out medications, taking blood pressure medications at night so patients are less symptomatic. Um, but ultimately, if patients don't tolerate these therapies, then they may need to go on to advanced therapies. And lastly, we'll talk quickly about medication adherence. Um, the World Health Organization just came out, actually not just, a while ago came out with kind of the top reasons for why patients are uh, non-adherent. That is the new term. We don't use compliance anymore. Non-adherent is uh, the preferred terminology. And it's really a combination of things. It's not always just the patient. It's not always just the health system. A lot of it is the number of medications they have. Um, and so these were the top identified reasons for non-adherence. Um, a lot of these, I do really understand polypharmacy has um, continued to grow and will continue to grow and expand uh, with the number of medications we have available for patients and even just the disease state of heart failure itself. Patients can be on upwards of, I mean, a minimum of five medications up to, you know, seven or eight just for this disease state in and of itself. And this obviously often does not uh, occur in a silo. Um, so a lot of these are things that we can't fix in a day, but there are maybe some strategies we can implement to try to work on moving forward. Here are some things that we have identified as really trying to utilize and focus our efforts around transitions of care. That is one of the largest areas where medications can get or often are adjusted. Um, so assessing patients' understanding of that as soon as they're discharged from the hospital. I just I discuss with patients before they leave the hospital every medication change. I give them information to take home with them and a basically a refrigerator list so that they have something clear, concise that's available for them to understand the differences um, from their previous medications. And honestly, some most often I see patients taking too many medications because they don't understand. They understand the new ones because everyone talks about the new ones, but nobody points out to them removing some of their old medications and not taking those. Um, evaluating their perspective and finding something within them um, that will make them want to take these medications or understand why they have to take these medications or should take these medications. Because um, a lot of times, you know, patients don't on a day-to-day -day basis feel the impact of a lot of these therapies like beta blockers. Sometimes beta blockers make them feel worse. Um, so helping them to understand why they're on it can help improve some of that adherence. Simplifying regimens whenever we can. That's a huge thing on my service and a huge thing, you know, in the clinic. It's probably what I do most is get rid of things <laughs> that we don't need. Um, and it, ideally not um, heart failure therapies, mostly just um, other things that have been prescribed down the road that the patient no longer, you know, needs from a chronic medication perspective. Um, again, just making sure whenever whatever education you do provide is patient friendly. There are a lot of adherence tools that we utilize. Um, or suggest in clinic, depending on the patient's um, kind of uh, socioeconomic status, their, what their interest areas are. A lot of people use phones these days. There are a lot of really great apps that patients can utilize, like the MediSafe app is one. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to tell names, but that one is actually very helpful um, for our patients. It's free for them. Um, nobody makes any money off of it. But um, that's been a good one that I found, and actually it can allow family members to also be involved with it. So if it is a someone who is an, you know, an older per, folks or someone who is living alone but needs help from a secondary source, they can actually look through at their logs and, and do things from that standpoint. So that's a really good one. There's a bunch of other ones that you can take a look at as well. Um, and then always reevaluate cost um, because a lot of these medications and uh, anticoagulants, other things can be very costly to them. And if they're deciding between buying dinner for the week and buying their medication, they're going to pick buying dinner. Um, and that's reasonable. And as providers, we should always be cognizant of that and should really make an effort to help uh, figure some of those things out to improve that, that adherence. So lastly, before we wrap up, just some considerations for the future. I really wish I could have talked about um, SGLT2 inhibitors for heart failure therapy because that is really where all of the new literature is coming from is will this become new guideline directed therapy with the benefits that have been shown in reducing hospitalization for these patients. I do know that the FDA is currently reviewing that data uh, to see if it, they will grant the SGLT2 inhibitors FDA approval for reduction in hospitalizations. Um, so that'll be pretty big news that's happening now. 
I don't know if that's been pushed back given everything else ongoing. Um, but if that does happen, um, maybe that would make its way into guideline therapy, which would help us get access to these medications. Because as of right now, most insurance companies will only approve it if they do have concomitant diabetes and they have to meet certain parameters with that as well. Uh, we just, I briefly have mentioned potassium binders. They aren't kind of the mainstay of therapy right now, so I didn't go into detail describing them, um, but utilizing those to really facilitate reaching some of these uh, goals for our guideline directed therapy is something that we um, often employ or have another tool kind of in our toolkit, but then, you know, balancing that with, as I just mentioned, adherence, <laughs> trying to minimize regimens is, is something that we and I have to figure out really how best to employ um, for patients moving forward and how to help optimize that. Um, there are some cardiac myotropes that are currently undergoing clinical trials. Um, don't know if that's gonna be a promising drug target. I do know obviously that is one area. We focus now a lot of on renin angiotensin. Um, we focus on the sympathetic nervous system, but really as far as um, cardiac contractility, don't have a ton of agents there with the exception of the digoxin, which hasn't shown great benefit. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Oops, sorry. And now if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. That was amazing. Uh, I really love the resources, the apps, and also the list that gets sent home with patients. I think that's really great. Yeah. Um, I had a question. I don't know. It's a little convoluted, so if you can't answer it, obviously, I know it's a little weird. But, um, you know, you, we spent a lot of time talking about ACE and ARB and then beta blockers. Mm -hmm. Do you have kind of like the first choice, like what you would recommend as um, I think as far as so beta blockers for me, I tend to, it, it really depends on the patient. Um, I tend to prefer metoprolol over carvedilol um, as an agent because it's more beta selective. So anyone who's got underlying pulmonary issues that kind of helps to remove that issue. But also it tends to, in the long term, allow me to have some more blood pressure room to optimize medications like ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or ARNIs. Um, with that being said, I do have a lot of hypertensive cardiomyopathy patients, and so those who persistently have a blood pressure of 140, um, there's maybe the small, uh, a smaller number than what the, maybe the minority, I guess is what I'm trying to say, um, yeah. and those obviously I would prefer. So it's really going to be patient dependent, but as a percentage wise for a majority of patients, I do believe metoprolol gives me some more room for optimization of other therapies. Um, as far as ASARB, ARNI. We try to utilize the ARNIs if we can, given that reduced mortality and morbidity in comparison to just ACE alone. Um, with that being said, cost is prohibitive sometimes, so we have to keep into consideration um, if they'll be able to afford it in the outpatient setting and how to help them navigate that. But that would be my preferred. As far as ACE inhibitors, lisinopril, I think, is the easiest. It's a once a day. Um, that way patients don't have to do multiple dosing. And then from an ARB standpoint, Valsartan probably has a little bit more potency than Losartan and is cheaper than Candesartan. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, we have some time. You're welcome to unmute and ask or chat in and I'll ask for you. And the one other thing I will mention given, you know, everything that's ongoing is that um, the Heart Failure Society of America, along with AHA and the American College of Cardiology, did put out a statement saying that ACE inhibitors and ARBs should be continued, um, given the amidst the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Uh, there were some concerns that patients, or I'm not really sure where the whole discussion came from, amidst whether or not that actually worsens patient outcomes. There is an association of hypertension and having some issues with um, mortality, I guess. Um, but there is data to support uh, against that and to continue uh, therapy as is. And as of right now, we are continuing to do so um, in our patient populations. So I have that slide up here if you guys want to see if you haven't seen it. But, um, it was a hidden slide. I didn't show it because I'm not really sure if people want to talk about it. Oh, oh how do I show a hidden slide? Okay, let's make it not hidden. There we uh, go. 
you'll have to share again. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. How do I? Okay. So for those of you who haven't seen it, this is their official statement that came out on Tuesday um, to continue to advise therapy at the I'm not an expert by any means. I don't think anyone is uh, with this virus, but uh, given their data, and I've watched a lot of extensive YouTube videos on the mechanism behind it, and again, a lot of this thought process comes from previous, um, I believe, previous SARS type of viruses, and and so for the, the time being, this is the way we're we're working. So. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. I'm excited to hear about the SGLT twos. We talk about them a ton in our endocrine. Yeah, talk yeah. patients, but that'd be great to simplify a little bit. Yeah, maybe do a separate session on it. I just figured this was probably kind of Absolutely. this is more of the the basic stuff, and and that's a little bit more of kind of the snazzy new hot on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and so yeah, we could potentially do another session sometime and talk about those, and and maybe by that time they'll actually be included into into therapy. The question then again is pill burden and really where we. <laughs> really how we best, again, we can, we can prescribe anything we want, we can do all of these studies, but until we are able to find a way where patients are able to go home and do these on a day-to-day -day basis, that's the biggest struggle that on a day-to-day, -day, you know, we find. So, always have to take it into consideration. <laughs> so. Well, definitely, thank you so much, Rachel. Everybody, if you have any questions, um, in the time after, obviously email me and I'll make sure Rachel gets those. Uh, I know everything's a little crazy right now. Obviously, a lot of us are working from home and whatever. <laughs> it's very weird. Yeah. Um, uh, just a short little plug. We will be having a COVID-19 update session. Dr. Hodder is an infectious disease doctor and she's going to be presenting uh, next Thursday, the 26th. If anybody is interested in seeing that, if you can't attend, I can send out the video. Yeah. Um, but I know it's a important and weird thing going on right now. Will you be sending that link out to everyone on the serve? Okay. I will. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Thanks. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you again, Rachel. That was great. Absolutely. You have a good day. Take care. We'll Thanks see you. Thank later. you. <laughs>